Manuel Pina Babbitt grew up in poverty in a small community of immigrants from the Cape Verde Islands in Wareham, Massachusetts. He and his seven brothers and sisters were raised by an abusive father and mentally ill mother in a house that was heated by wood and insulated with newspaper, without a toilet or hot water. Manuel suffered from learning disabilities in school and dropped out after seventh grade at the age of 17. Barely 18, he joined the Marines in 1967. The recruiter gave him a general intelligence test, but Manuel could barely read it, so the recruiter filled it in for him. Manuel's fate personifies the treatment of many working-class youth who were first used and in many cases destroyed during America's war in Indochina and then discarded. Manuel recalled one of his first assignments, loading shells filled with thousands of darts. A bunch of little tiny nails hit little tiny humans and all the humans fell. There'd be nothing but blood and guts on the landscape and that was the kind of things I had to look at. Within six months he was in Key San in the middle of a 77-day siege of the U.S. fire base by the North Vietnamese Army, one of the longest and bloodiest battles in the war. Manuel was one of the 2,000 Marines wounded at Ki San when on the 56th day of the battle he was struck in the head and hand by rocket fragments. He was evacuated in a helicopter filled with dead Marines in body bags. One week later he was flown back to Ki San. When the siege was finally lifted in July 1968, after U.S. bombers had laid waste to the area, nearly 1,000 U.S. Marines, 15,000 North Vietnamese soldiers and thousands of civilians were dead. After Ki San, Manuel fought another bloody battle, and then went home where he married and signed up for another tour. He was assigned to guard duty at a military base in Quonset Point, Rhode Island where he lived with his new family. But the impact of Vietnam left deep mental scars. At home he would scream to his wife to grab the babies and run for cover from the bombs. He took LSD, a habit he began in Vietnam, and soon went absent without leave. After the third incident, he was discharged from the Marines and his family evicted from the military base. At the time a close friend said, he had always had troubles, and he wasn't particularly bright, but the Manuel that came back from overseas was nuts. Soon Manuel turned to crime, including robbing gas stations and vacant summer homes. On October 24, 1973 he was sentenced to eight years in state prison for armed robbery. Later he was admitted to the infamous Bridgewater State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, a prison hospital that gained national notoriety in 1967, when the documentary T.T. Cut Follies chronicled shocking abuses of patients by hospital workers. After returning to prison, he was sent back to the hospital two months later when he attempted suicide because his wife was leaving him. In 1975 he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and granted parole from the hospital. He soon returned to the streets, like thousands of the more than 500,000 Vietnam veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder who were left without treatment. Soon after moving to Sacramento, California to live with his brother Bill, Manuel was involved in the assault on Leah Schendel. On the afternoon before the attack he drank and took drugs with another Vietnam veteran. Manuel says he does not remember attacking Schendel or another woman the next night who was beaten. All he remembers is seeing car headlights in the foggy night that he believed were incoming aircraft or exploding mortars. On the night between December 18 and 19, 1980, Manuel Pina Babbitt broke into the South Sacramento apartment of Leah Schendel and brutally beat and sexually assaulted the 78-year-old woman. He also attempted to rape Mrs. Schendel before ransacking and robbing her residence. Leah Schendel had a large and close family and had spent the evening of her murder with her siblings. Her brother and sister-in-law drove her home and walked her to the door. As they left, they saw a man walking nearby. Later that night, Leah's apartment was ransacked, the intruder had cut through her screen door and viciously attacked her. Leah was only 5 feet tall and weighed less than 100 pounds. 
Mrs. Schendel's brutally beaten semi-nude body was found lying on the floor of her bedroom, partially covered by a blood-stained mattress. Later coroner examinations indicated that she may have been sexually assaulted. Mrs. Schendel's cause of death was determined to be heart failure caused by stress related to the robbery and beating. The following night, December 19, 1980, Manuel attempted to rape another Sacramento woman, whom he grabbed and beat unconscious before robbing her of money and jewelry. Following his arrest, he did not deny committing the crimes, but said he had no memory of what happened. However, several items of Mrs. Schendel's property were found in his possession, linking him to her murder. Manuel was convicted of murder robbery and attempted rape. He was also convicted of robbing and attempting to rape another Sacramento woman, whom he grabbed and beat unconscious the following night. He did not deny the attacks. But he claimed insanity or diminished capacity because of head injuries suffered at age 12 and aggravated during two combat tours as a Marine in Vietnam. State and federal courts upheld his convictions and sentence, and the Supreme Court denied review of his appeal. The lawyers who argued for Manuel's appeal said Manuel saw the lights and disassociated. The sight of aircraft would always be followed by enemy fire in Vietnam and soldiers would duck for cover. His lawyers said Manuel ran for cover into Schendel's house and then beat her when she panicked. The old woman was found with a mattress over her head and a leather cord tied around her ankle. Manuel's attorneys say this was significant because when a Marine was killed in combat his friends tried to protect the body from further damage by covering the corpse with whatever was handy. They would also try to tie something around the ankle or foot to identify the body before it was evacuated. The police captured Manuel with the aid of Bill Babbitt who was desperately seeking help for his troubled brother. Bill said the police urged me to try to solicit a confession from him so it would expedite his care. They told me, you don't have to worry about your brother going to the gas chamber. We're going to find a hospital for him, perhaps a place like Vacaville, he added, referring to the state prison that has a medical and psychiatric facility. Bill has since said he feels like Judas for delivering his brother into the hands of the executioners. Manuel's case received widespread support from veterans groups, prominent writers, death penalty opponents, mental illness associations, and even former jurors in the trial who said they would never have sentenced him to death if they had been aware of his mental disorders. After lobbying from veterans, Manuel Babbitt received the Purple Heart Medal while on death row. He was shuffled into a prison room shackled in a chain that wrapped around his waist between his legs, to his handcuffed wrists. As a sergeant major read the citation documenting Manuel's wounds at Key San, Manuel tried to salute. He could not raise his manacled hands to his forehead so he scrunched forward at the waist, bringing his forehead to his hand, held stiff in salute. On death row for 18 years, Manuel Pina Babbitt, a 50-year-old grandfather, was executed by lethal injection at San Quentin Prison after last-ditch appeals to state and federal courts failed to win a stay of execution. More than 700 protesters gathered outside the prison just north of San Francisco to voice their opposition to the death penalty and support for Manuel. Manuel spent his 50th birthday, counting down the hours to his execution. He asked that the $50 allotted for his last meal go to homeless veterans. Hours after watching the execution, William Babbitt gathered his thoughts at a Half Moon Bay hideaway and let them fly. I'm at peace, said William Babbitt. But any peace he feels is tinged with bitterness stretching back years. William Babbitt turned his brother into police for Schendel's murder after, he says, he was assured that his younger brother would get help not execution. If Manuel Babbitt, a former Vietnam veteran, tortured by post-war mental disorders, had been kept safely in a mental hospital, if he had gotten the help he needed, he and Leah Schendel would not have died the way they did, William Babbitt said. My brother died as a result of state-sanctioned murder, and history will come to realize that fact, 
said Babbitt. After the execution William Babbitt said he will take his brother's body back to Massachusetts and bury him next to their father, who died when the two were teenagers. Unlike some on death row who spend their last days in near solitude, Manuel Babbitt was never far from familiar faces. Family and friends came in swarms, swelling to as many as two dozen in one day. According to an attorney for Manuel, who kept company with him in his last hours and witnessed his execution, he was completely calm. It was family and friends, not Manuel Babbitt, who urged last-minute legal appeals. When his time came, Manuel Babbitt himself never appeared to open his eyes, never looked around at the witnesses gathered to see him die or to bid him farewell. Instead, he issued his last words through the warden, I forgive all of you. Manuel chose no last meal, deciding instead to continue the fast he had begun several days ago as it became evident his execution would go through as scheduled. When he was led to the death chamber, he was restrained with narrow handcuffs, instead of the wider leather restraints, to make it easier to find a vein in his wrist, if one was needed. He was pronounced dead at 12.37 a.m. on May 4, 1999.